action. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome back. This is Show and Tell, a podcast that's been happening just about weekly these days. And usually we talk about vintage knitting. Sometimes I have a guest. Today is one of those days. I know you'll be happy to know that. Before I bring Allison on, let me just remind you that you can find me on Ravelry and Instagram at Billy Toy, and I will put that on the screen somewhere. And don't forget to subscribe and don't forget to give it a thumbs up. And when you subscribe, there are three bells. The top bell is the bell that will give you all the notifications. I'm still a little bit confused about how YouTube does this because it seems like some people know when I'm going live, some people know when I'm doing a premiere, and other people hear about it moments before it happens. A good time to look for me is Thursdays at 2 o'clock Eastern, so that would be 11 a.m. Pacific and evening in Europe, depending on where you're at. Um, if you're in other parts of the world, you'll have to figure it out. I know that Australia and New Zealand are, I think, 16 hours ahead of me. So next day. Uh, okay, so don't go away. I'm going to be right back with my guest, Allison. Stay tuned. Okay, and welcome back. Today's guest is Allison. I know she's going to tell us a little bit about Neutrino, but because she is a vintage knitter, I want to mainly focus on that. And she's going to show us some of her vintage knits. But I'm going to ask the question I ask all of my guests. A lot of them are not American. Allison happens to be living in the United States. So I'm going to ask you what I ask the others. Please tell us about where you live, the town, and if there's something specific there that if we came to visit your town, we wouldn't necessarily find us towards some inside scoop that you could give us. Yes. Um, so I, I'm Allison. I live in Seattle, Washington on the West Coast. And um, I've lived here now for, oh, almost 20 years. Um, it is an amazing place uh, because, you know, we have tons of amazing outdoors activities, but also um, a real mix of, of different kind of cultures. And, you know, so I love living in a, a bigger city like Seattle because there's tons of um, vintage stuff you can do. Um, one of my favorite places is Century Ballroom and they hold a ton of swing dances um, with live bands, sometimes not live bands, but um, there's just a really great kind of swing community out here. A number of places that teach classes and, um, and so it's a ton of fun if you are ever visiting. I recommend you check their schedule. Hopefully, uh, they'll be having dances again soon. <laughs> we were in Seattle a couple of times in recent years because our son had a fellowship at Microsoft. Wow. And he was living in Bellevue. So we helped him move out there. We helped him move back to the East Coast when his fellowship ended. And that would have been really fun for us because we like to swing dance. So, and he's, Next time. he's a wannabe. He's, you know, young. It's really like the, the younger generation, I think more than my generation, that's really embracing it, which I'm so happy about because it's such a wonderful thing. Like the original swing dancer, Frankie Manning, who was a New Yorker, I got to see him when he was still alive. And he would keep introducing it to the younger people. And it's wonderful that people want to keep it alive because those original guys, they're gone. Yeah. So it's up to us and the next group, like my son's age, to really keep it moving forward. And it's such a fun thing, especially if you're a vintage lover and you can dress up. And Oh, yes, definitely. All right. So that's a really good tip. Thank you. Wonderful. Okay, so show us um, whatever 
whatever you want. I know that we talked about a couple of things that I saw on your Instagram. Tell us your Instagram handle so that people can find you. So I don't actually have, well, I, I, I don't have my own Instagram. Um, it's Nitrino, which is knit R I N O. And, and I'll put that on the screen. Uh, okay. It's a, uh, and it's for my business. I'm with my, my sister, I'm a co-founder of Nitrino. So, um, but, but sometimes you'll see my vintage knits on there because I'm just a vintage girl. <laughs> Let's look at sweaters and then we'll talk a little bit about Nitrino because I have some questions about it. Oh, cool. Um, so I'll just start with what I'm wearing, okay. um, which I'm getting warm, so I'm going to take it off anyway. Um, but this, um, so I'll scoot back a little. This is a 1950s um, cardigan, cable cardigan. Um, it was my second cable project ever. My first was what I'm wearing here. <laughs> and um, it was from Smart Knitting. I think it was 1951. Did I say that already? And um, and so anyway, I love it because it is um, just cropped and a little loose and it's got the dolman sleeves. Um, and then uh, and I, it turns out I wear it all the time. It's like my uniform. I wear it every day. <laughs> and then um, this is actually um, my take. Uh, so this I didn't have a pattern for. Um, I just made it up myself. Oh. But I I saw a lot of these vintage patterns that um, had some unique waist shaping under the bust that I really liked. And so I just decided to try doing that with cables. So this was actually, I wanted to learn how to do cables. So this was my first cable project. And you can see um, it has all this little cable detail under the bust um, mm -hmm. that kind of tapers off on the sides. Um, and then I did add, um, a little extra increases under the bust just to get the shaping the way I wanted it. Um, and then the, I added the keyhole. It wasn't actually supposed to be perfectly round. <laughs> I was trying to do a teardrop, uh, but I guess I got my calculations off. And anyway, it looks pretty cute, totally round. So um, how did you do that? Well, I, I just bound off a few stitches um, as I was working across the front and then um, did a gradual one stitch decrease I, I think it was just one stitch but all the way here. One or two stitches in from the edge. Yep. In from the center. Yep. Right. And then and then I just cast on, or actually I think right here I just increased with increased. probably make ones and then cast on for the little um the little button here that opens so I can get my head through it. <laughs> That's simply amazing. Yeah, I, I just I love how it came out. And this is in um Earl Grey fibers um, in in her uh, it's a yak sock blend. Mm, sounds dreamy. Now, had you not been knitting a long time when you experimented with this? Yeah, I well, so I've only been knitting um, since after we founded Neutrino, so it's been just over two years. Um, Unbelievable. And, yeah. But but I will say uh, my mother taught me how to sew when I was very young um, as a part of my homeschooling education. Uh, and, and so I really have a good handle on construction. Um, e even though I haven't been knitting long, I get kind of how the pieces go together. Um, and so that that definitely makes it a little a little easier for me to envision, like to know to put the increases under the bus to get the shaping that I wanted. And how did you do those increases under the bus? Um, they were just uh, so short rows, or no, just um, just make ones, but the placement of them instead of like distributing them evenly or putting them in the underarms, um, I I put them under the bust just so that's where the fullness would be. And you knew to do that because you had experience sewing. Yeah, just I was thinking okay. if they were darts, this is what I do, you know. So right, that would not be a natural inclination for me. But then again, I don't need that bust adjusting. So I guess if you are in the camp that does, then you probably find out that you need to do that. But I, I had somebody else who I interviewed, Liz, who also is more of a sewer than a knitter. And she described the same kind of thing. Those, what is it called? Uh, something or other bust adjustment. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's two. And this is cable light because the cables are Short, the other sweater, the cardigan. Yes. Cables are, that's a lot of cabling. By the time you're done that, you're experienced. Yes, yes. I, I really felt like I got a handle on it. With this, I, I felt confident enough to do something bigger cabled. 
<laughs> were you using one of those cable stitch holders or you just let the stitches dangle and then you went back and picked them up? Um, so normally, you mean for, for this or? Doing the cables. Um, like so I actually, when I cable, I, I cable without a needle or anything. Without a needle. Yeah, so I just um, insert my needle kind of backwards to flip the stitches around so that I don't have to set down. With, I'm impatient, so. <laughs> okay, I mean, that's something that a more experienced knitter would perhaps know to do, not a rookie. So that's impressive <laughs> too. Oh, thank you. And anything to save time. <laughs> okay, what else? Um, so I have, um, Oh, you know what? Just before we move on, one thing I want to say about this sweater, which is awesome, and I should have, I don't think I, oh, I did grab the pattern book that it's in. It's right here. So this is the issue that it's in of Smart Knitting, and it is actually the, oh, this one. My camera is mirrored. Mm -hmm. This okay. one right here. Um, I love it because it has such an interesting construction as well. Like you actually knit um, the each side of the front from the bottom up um, and then you know do the dolman sleeve so it's all knit in one piece and then you put it on holders knit the other side and then join and knit, knit down the back so you kind of knit up and over which was so much fun it felt like a little adventure so i'm trying to picture this you're knitting up the front you get to the sleeve you cast on extra stitches and now you're knitting up the sleeve at, and the front at the same time yeah. And then you go over the shoulder and over the sleeve to the back of the sleeve. Yeah. Got it. And then you keep knitting. Yeah. It was, it so was a really one piece. Yeah, um, pretty much. Yeah. I mean, you know, you have to seam up the sides under the arm from the sleeve. seaming. Okay. But yeah. when you lay it out, it's just one big piece with four sides. The back is going yeah, north, much. the front is yeah. going south, and the arms are going east and west. And then yeah. there's a hole in the center where the neck would be. But it's a cardigan, so yeah. there's something down the front. Now, it's not oh, yeah. So it, I, I, I just loved knitting it. If anybody is looking for a good cable cardigan, it's a good one. It wasn't steeped up the front, was it? No. Okay. Because <laughs> that would be very, very advanced. Yeah, <laughs> no, no, it wasn't. Um, okay, so let's see. I have, <clears throat> I'll show, um, actually, look, this is the first thing I ever knit. Um, when I told my sister, I was like, okay, I have to learn how to knit. So can you teach me? Um, she wanted to teach me just with, you know, a scarf or a hat or whatever most people learn with. And I said, I'm not going to finish it if it's something I'm not excited about. Mm -hmm. And so I picked, um, actually, I have that here as well. I picked a sweater. It's from this issue of Vogue Knitting, 1952. Oops, the back cover of this. Is the 50s your favorite time period? Not really. Actually, I tend to lean more toward the late 30s, early 40s. Um, but sometimes I dabble in the 50s. So, um, and actually my sister jokes, I'm going backwards through time because in high school and college, I wore a, a lot more of the kind of mid to late fifties and I've slowly been marching backwards. <laughs> um, but it is, let's see if I can line it up here. It's this V-neck uh, right here mm -hmm. uh, uh, with the plaid skirt. Mm -hmm. That's what I wanted to knit. And so, it is, um, it's right here. And I just, it's knit on, I think it was on twos. It's a fingering white sweater. And I love that it just, it has this little V-neck uh, on the front and the back, which is mm -hmm. just such a cute detail, three quarter sleeves. And I was so excited to finish it and wear it that I think uh, that it's that feeling that got me really hooked. <laughs> so I, I was thrilled to, to start with something that I loved, you know? I no longer have the first sweater that I knit because it was probably before you were born. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm trying even to remember, I know there was a whole time period where I had left my corporate job and I was trying to socialize with people. And I used to go to a yarn shop and I would hang out at the table and talk to the other people who were there knitting. So I remember a couple of things. I don't remember which one was really the very first one, but 
it's nice that you still have yours. I wish I yes, did. Well, it's only been a few years. I'm sure eventually <laughs> well, it'll wear out. No, I mean, they look very respectable. And because they're vintage, they're timeless. Yeah. So, I mean, my thing, that's probably why I got rid of it. It wasn't timeless. Yeah. So um, the next one um, comes from a knitting book. So I love to, you probably can tell, I love to collect the old patterns and books, the magazines. Um, I try my best to get originals whenever I can, in part mm. because I worry that they're disappearing. And I'm, maybe I'm hoarding them so that I'll know that they're, they're always in existence. Um, but this one is extra special um, and it's from a, uh, I want to say, I have to double check, I think it's from Australian Knitting Illustrated or something like that. And um, it was wartime. And so it's a scrappy project, which I just loved. It's called Stripes Ahoy. And I just used a bunch of scraps and bought a few minis to fill it out to get um, a little bit better color in it. This and is also fingering. Fingering weight, yep. And uh, I just love how it came out. And it I don't even think it used a full skein of the base color. Oh, that's what happened. Um, I think it was supposed to have stripy sleeves and I ran out of some of my other colors. So I had to do solid sleeves. Okay. Um, but I, I love that. I love that it's scrappy. And, and so I have the book right here. I actually marked it to make it faster. And, um, oh, I marked it and then can't find my bookmark. Um, and so this is the actual picture. Um, and it's just darling, I love it so much. And so, uh, and this is the book that it's in, uh, Practical Knitting Illustrated. Look, not just a little pamphlet, a whole book. And I have three of these. I bought them all from the same seller on Etsy. Um, and, and they're in pretty bad shape, like the binding is broken um, and falling apart. But I, I do plan at some point to figure out how to how to digitize these and archive them and, and share them so that other people can can have the joy of them. And in my free time, sometime I'll do that. But just had a conversation with somebody about copywriting. You got to be careful. Yeah. I don't know all the nuances of the law, but yeah, I'm sure you have lawyers with Nichino who will guide. Yeah, you. yeah. And I mean, um, you know, certainly there are a lot of people you know, selling them digitally and, and all of that. Um, some of them are in still in copyright and some of them aren't. So <laughs> anyway, um, and I guess, let's see, I've got a couple more, but I'll just show you maybe one. Oh, no. Well, two more. I'll show you this one and then my, my epic one. Okay. <laughs> um, so this one I actually just finished. I think um, I did it just in the last few months. I can't really remember. Yeah, it would have been in the fall or winter um and this is a little vest um, that i should have color seen. work yes and um so I, I again i wanted to learn i wanted to be better at stranding i had tried um, one other time and i wasn't very happy with how it came out and so i just decided to dive in um and i was really bad at it for the first like couple rows and pretty quickly I got better at it. I just decided that the vest is going to be my journey. It's going to show my progress. <laughs> and so I, I'm just thrilled with how it came out. Um, the colors in this are all from um, Little Fox yarn. Um, the colors look lovely. Yeah, I just love how it came out. And this actually, um, I put, so I, I, the pattern was really bad. I, I modernized it a lot. But I put the color work chart um, into Neutrino so that I could knit from it. Um, now, of course, it's just for me. Nobody else can see it. Um, but it, it was so much fun to be able to knit a vintage pattern in my app. Um, I figured if, if you get no perks out of building an app, that should be the one you get. <laughs> since, I mean, since we're on that topic, tell us a little bit about Neutrino. Neutrino. I almost said Neutrino. Yeah, that's what it's named after. <laughs> I think I sort of knew that because the logo. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about it and tell us if you please have any plans to include anything vintage for my viewers. Um, so first, Neutrino, we think of Neutrino as 
being for the knitting pattern, what Google Maps was for the Atlas. Uh, you know, the Atlas has all the information, but it's not the easiest to use while you're driving. And, and that's kind of, uh, I think a good analogy for Neutrino. You know, we show you, we try to give you a visualization of the pattern. So um, every, every pattern um, has both charted and written instructions. So you can always see where you are. You can um, keep track of your progress uh, row by row. You mark your rows complete. You can click on any stitch to see what it is and how to do it. Um, and uh, the thing I love like with that vest is uh, you can change your color work charts to match your yarn and kind of play around with them to see what color combinations you like. But for um, the people so who are hearing this the first time, it's only the patterns that you have. Yeah, that's right. Curated. We, we are a publisher. So we work a lot like a magazine. Uh, we take patterns from independent designers um, and pay them. Actually, I think we pay the highest rates in the industry um, for their work. And, and then we get that pattern for a limited time. It'll be on Neutrino for a limited time and then it disappears. And so new things come out all the, all the time, not as fast as we want them to. Uh, we are currently the bottleneck uh, because we have to build everyone um, on the back end. And so- How many, how many patterns are there presently? Uh, we just launched a new one today that I think might put us at 10 um, and a couple have already gone away. They were limited time mm -hmm. things. So, um, so and not, we do I mean, Go not ahead. to confuse people because there are other apps out there where you plug in your yes. PDF of whatever yes. your thing is. This is not that. This, this is, is not that at all. Different. And, and I think we should just give them the website so that they can yeah. go and see it and read about it. But I'm hoping that maybe you can put some of these out of copyright vintage patterns in there so that I think I think eventually we will. I mean, I right because I want them in there. Yeah, <laughs> um, right now, the the biggest problem is um, that because we have to build every pattern manually, things that are graded like sweaters take forever, and so. Um, so that is what's really slowing us down. And and like often, you know, I'll build something in my size, but it you know i wouldn't want to put it out there unless there are lots of sizes for people and so it's it's that that kind of takes the time but we do hope that um, all of this should get faster as we grow i mean neutrino is still a baby uh we had a, a two-year gestation period and gave birth to neutrino just a few months ago so um we do hope that all of this will improve and speed up and um uh, you know, and then eventually I'd love to get some vintage things in there. So. so in my prior life, I was a management consultant and my advice would be to you, I don't think you'd have any problem getting test knitters who would knit in a wide variety of sizes oh, yeah. and give you all of the stitch counts and whatever it is that you need to plug into your app. And I think virtually overnight, you would have the array of sizes that you want. Yeah, there, there's a lot to it. <laughs> okay. So I mean, uh, I would volunteer if it was something that I wanted yeah. to knit for myself, like yeah. I'm knitting um, this, which is a 1949 thing right now. I have a knit along going with a few other people. Love that. I believe that this is out of copyright. It's British and their laws are different there. Um, the pattern is only for one size, yeah. but I think that one could find people who are size 50 bust who would want to do more repeats of the pattern and try and figure it out and report back in yeah. uh, to be able to use the app for, you know, free for a lifetime or what, you know, there's always, where there's a will, there's a way, I believe. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I love the enthusiasm. You these diplomas that are hanging behind you. <laughs> What's that? What about this? This is a, an unusual thing for a knitter to have their yeah. knees hanging. Yeah, so um, when we started Neutrino, we were having a lot of video calls uh, with developers and, um, investors uh, we, we don't have any outside investors but um 
we could. <laughs> but um, it, it was funny because people hear knitting app and they're like, oh, that's cute. So cute. And I just got a little tired of people not taking me seriously. So I strategically hung my diplomas behind me. And normally I sit offset just right. So I'm, um, my camera's reversed, but normally I sit like this. So you Do can people see. comment. Do people comment? Uh, nobody commented, but, no. but you could tell, you know, you could tell people, uh, you, you can always tell when people, they use the word cute a lot. Oh, that's cute. And I'm like, well, it is cute, but <laughs> it's also a serious business. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm very intrigued because you mentioned that you were homeschooled. Yeah. And I also know from our little chat before that math is something that you embrace and love. Yes. Um, yes. Who was homeschooling you? And <laughs> um, they also love math. So my mother and father were both teachers. Um, my mom taught elementary school and my dad taught um, junior high literature. And, um, and so they recognized that my sister and I had a lot of aptitude and felt like we would get a better education if, if my mother stopped working and taught us at home. And so uh, for four years, we were homeschooled and we got, we both got really far ahead in, in pretty much all our subjects. Um, and then went to public school and for me, it was junior high and for her, it was high school. Um, and both of us, it, it's kind of funny because it was a very religious uh, upbringing. Uh, like we didn't learn about evolution or anything. And, um, both of us turned out to be scientists. So I'm a physicist, she is a biologist, um, and she actually uh, taught high school um, science and biology and um, advanced placement statistics. Um, and so it's kind of funny that, that we both came out of this rather religious conservative upbringing <laughs> to, be, to be scientists and, you know, kind of. Right, neither parent was a scientist. I mean, yeah. in my case, my dad had a PhD in chemistry. I was not homeschooled. I admire anyone who's able to do it. I couldn't even imagine with our child who from early on I could see was extraordinarily bright and questioning things. And he ended up going to MIT. <laughs> and earned an advanced degree there as well as his undergraduate degree. But I saw early on that there was no way that I was gonna be able to teach him because at a certain point, he was smarter than I was in certain, in certain yeah. areas. I mean, computer science, which is his field, he's off the charts. So, right. you know. It, yeah, I think, I think that was part of why they ended up putting us in public school was um, because yes, my, yes. my mom would always say she was so worried that that she wouldn't be able to teach us physics and chemistry and calculus and um, and those were the things that that I at least loved. Um, I, I couldn't I went through um, I think in sixth grade I went through the full algebra textbook it was for the next year in three months. Like I, I just, I couldn't put it down. It was like a little addiction for me. <laughs> Probably not healthy, but. <laughs> but for her credit, she was astute enough to yeah. realize that she yes. had reached that yep. juncture and then, you know, put you into the next phase of your life. That's yeah. important. We give them tons of credit for, for everything. I mean, you know, I just having that opportunity, even though we were pretty poor, like it, it really gave us a, a leg up, I think, in, in just in life, you know, getting getting that focused education. And how does this help you in your business? Um, you know, I think if nothing else, the things that we are good at, my sister and I, um, the things that we learned, uh, whether they meant us to or not, was how to think critically and also how to be resilient. And I think every day, I'm resilient. Sorry, think critically and? Be resilient. Be resilient. Yeah. And I think every day, both of those things, um, you know, are, are the things that move us forward. Um, figuring out which problem to solve and which one to let go. Mm. Figuring out which app store review to let go and which customer to, to actually listen to, you know, um, 
it's it's funny what a depressing business having your own company can be <laughs> um, because because you get a lot a lot of support and a lot of enthusiasm but you also get a lot of crap um, and so we, we say all the time you know it's the resiliency that is crucial to being an entrepreneur it's so just rewarding to hear this and i hope that other people eventually will listen and um you know, maybe learn something from this it's it's a big leap of faith i have started my own business more than once um it's definitely a leap of faith and it's wonderful to have support now i always did it myself you have a sister act which is yeah, incredible no thing I, I think. yeah it's it is it's incredible we um it's, and it's really funny because Andrea always does this. She'll hold up her hands and she'll say, this is the Venn diagram of us. And there's this teeny tiny little area of overlap. And in that area is our parents, knitting and science. <laughs> and But all of our strengths and weaknesses are, are kind of opposite, which right. is so fabulous. Divide, divide and conquer. Fabulous. In a I had to do it all. I had to do the shipping. I had to do the ordering. Yeah. I had to. Oh, poor me. I had to go to Europe twice a year and oh, shop. <laughs> anyway, I think you have one more knit to show yes. us. Yeah, one more knit, one okay. more epic knit. So let's see, how will I do this? Um, let me just hold it up. I got it right here. Oop, it's falling off the hanger. I, I also have another one I'm working on. So if anyone is coming to Rhinebeck, you'll see another epic knit this year. Is there Rhinebeck? Do we know for sure? Well, we know it's scheduled and we know that I booked a hotel. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, I'm planning to be there. We'll see. But this was my Rhinebeck at the, at the last Rhinebeck, which would have been 19, 2019. Yes, because 20 was canceled. Yes, 20, I mean, 20 was canceled. Um, this, it's a dress. This is the top. It's a two piece dress. Um, and it is also from 1951. So here, I can't, maybe if I back up a little more, you can kind of see. And um, it has a very, uh, it has a fluted, I don't know what you call that, full skirt at the bottom. Um, now these and, dragonfly, yes. dragonflies, right? Are yes. those duplicate stitch or is that intarsia? It's intarsia. And I I didn't know I didn't know intarsia was a thing. I didn't know the word. And in fact, I found that uh, in vintage magazines, they don't use the word intarsia. So I I called this surprise intarsia uh, because I got to it and then it was like surprise. Hmm. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was it was really um, an epic knit and it is in um, I, and I did modify it a little. I changed the sleeves to make it a little more 40s and a little less 50s. I know hey. how long did that take you? Do you know? Do you it should have that? taken me much longer than it did. Here it is. So here is the um, original pattern there. And this is the um, 1949 Vogue knitting. And, and so I brought it back maybe a decade, but it should have taken a lot longer. I started it six weeks before Rhinebeck, so I was on a deadline. I will say it zapped a lot of the joy for me. Um, six weeks to yeah. do that whole thing? Yeah, I just, I was getting angry by the end. <laughs> so um, I, I would not advise taking something like this on in six weeks. Um, but, well, but a it lot was, of it, I mean, in all fairness, a lot of it is stuck in that. Yeah, that's true. That was, the, that was the lifesaver, but it was fingering weight on size two needles. Oh, yeah. And oh. so it, it's over a hundred thousand stitches, you know, and uh, yeah, it was, I took a break after that. I was like, you know, I'm just, I'm only going to knit easy things or not knit anything on a deadline. <laughs> I don't know how many stitches this is. It's probably not anywhere near that, but it is going to take me a good six weeks because yeah. it's complicated. Yeah. I, I mean, for the first couple of pieces, I didn't, even now, I don't really have the pattern memorized. It's a 12 row repeat. Yeah. One of the gals in the knit along, she's memorized it, but I have to like stop what I'm doing, look yeah. at the beginning and the end. And make, anyway, 
this is going to be at least six weeks. So I'm impressed if you could do a yeah. full length dress. Wow. Yeah. And just for a frame of reference, like tip, a typical, a typical, whatever, but um, a sweater, like a full sleeve sweater is generally somewhere around 30 to 40,000 stitches, depending on the size you're knitting um, in fingering weight. So I normally don't know how many stitches, but there is one pattern that I knit that's a vintage pattern that I threw into an Excel spreadsheet because there were a lot of elements to it. There was a collar, there were um, different pockets at the top, then the patch pockets at the bottom, there's a belt, there, and very unusual construction. I'm not quite finished with it. It's like 98% done, but I charted it because I wanted to make sure I was gonna have enough yarn because it was a vintage pattern that didn't have that information as part of it. Yeah. And that was over a hundred thousand yep. stitches, but it's, it's not a dress. It's a jacket yeah. with an intricate pattern on the sleeve and mostly stocking up, but all these extra little parts, they add yeah. up, you know, yeah. knitting the pockets inside the outside. Yeah. That, that's the way I felt with this dragonfly dress, because like just even the little collar was so complicated to put mm. together. <laughs> I was like, oh. But I find, and tell me if you don't agree, I find that's the charm of the vintage things that each oh, yeah. one is unique. Yeah, definitely. It's not, it's not like contemporary patterns where it's like, you know, rectangle front, rectangle back, stitch them together at the shoulder and down the side yeah. and, you know, pick up the stitches around to make your sleeve. No, every single vintage one has something like really different and interesting about it. I don't know if I can ever go back to knitting just regular now that I've uh, tasted vintage. Yeah. It's really fun. Well, I think we've covered a lot of ground. Um, is there anything that I missed asking you? I'll put whatever I need to in the show notes, um, you know, the Great. website. Ravelry, you wanna tell us your Ravelry handle? Uh, I'm, I I mean, we have a Neutrino Ravelry. I, I don't really use Ravelry. Okay. Uh, just because I was late to knitting. And so I. Okay. So the only place where we can see your knits is right here. Yeah. Yeah. And on Instagram, they show up a lot. So. On Instagram. Okay. Yeah. We got that one. Okay. Um, thanks for joining me today. And You're so welcome. Um, I hope I'll see you at Rhinebeck. I hope that I'll be able to go there to this year yeah um i've never been i i and some of the other vintage knitters um are talking about a vintage knit meetup um so i will i will keep oh, think of me i know that you know someone else who i know is that fran. oh fran, fran yes yeah I love fran yeah so that'd be great um i look forward to meeting you in person then me too. Wouldn't it be great? Yes, yes. I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Me. Thanks, Allison. Thank you. Bye. Bye. 